The girl left home and headed to Sunday school with a Bible in her hands. She was supposed to walk less than a kilometer in a straight line, but she never made it to the church. Police and hundreds of volunteers searched for her, but they couldn't find the girl. This mystery remained unsolved for 48 years until the truth surfaced in the most unusual way. Gretchen Harrington was born on June 13, 1967, in the American state of Pennsylvania. Her parents had two more daughters, and shortly after Gretchen's birth, the whole family moved to the small town of Brumel. The girl's father was a priest, and he was offered a job at the local church, along with housing. Gretchen loved this place, spending whole days outdoors with friends. Brumal was a very safe place. So parents had no fear letting their children play outside until dark. There were many parks and a river where children liked to go. The girl also attended Sunday school regularly and excelled in her studies. On the morning of August 15, 1975, when Gretchen was eight, it was a joyful day for her family. The girl's mother had recently given birth to their fourth daughter and was supposed to come home from the hospital with her. Gretchen wanted to wait for her, but her father advised her not to miss Sunday school to maintain her perfect grades. Reluctantly, she agreed, took her Bible, and went to church. Usually, her older sisters accompanied her, but that morning, they both stayed home. However, Gretchen was not afraid to walk on Medna Street, and the Sunday school was less than a kilometer away in a straight line. The classes were held at Trinity Church, and it would take her only about eight minutes to get there. The Sunday school classes consisted of two parts. First, the children gathered at Trinity Church, and about an hour and a half later, some of them went to Father Gretchen's church. But at around 11 a.m., when the students arrived at the second church, Gretchen's father noticed that she was not among them. It was strange because the children were escorted in one group. He thought Gretchen might have stayed at the other church and called there. David's wife, who taught at Sunday school, answered the call. She said they didn't have the girl and told him about what was happening. Surprised, he learned that Gretchen hadn't attended his class that morning. Her father began to worry seriously. He asked David to call the police and set out to search for his daughter. He drove along the route between the churches, checked neighboring streets, but the girl was nowhere to be found. He also contacted Gretchen's friend's parents, hoping she went for a walk with one of them. But all of them were either at church or at home. Even her best friend, David's wife, had not seen the girl. The police immediately started the search. As soon as news of Gretchen's disappearance spread through the town, several hundred volunteers joined them. Almost all local residents knew the girl's father from church and wanted to help. Along with volunteers, the police covered the entire town, then began searching numerous parks and the riverbank. Later, a police helicopter was sent to help surveying the area from the air. The searches continued into the night, but they yielded no results. The next day, even more volunteers joined the effort. Later, flyers with Gretchen's photo and information about her disappearance were created. They were posted along roads and handed out to passing drivers. Despite all these efforts, the police not only failed to find the girl, but also couldn't determine what had happened to her. In several days of searching, they found no significant clues, and Gretchen's fate remained unknown. Her disappearance was a heavy blow to many town residents. They were accustomed to letting their children play unsupervised from an early age, and nothing like this had ever happened before. They could roam the parks for hours, swim in the river without adults worrying, but now, everything had changed. Adding to the worry was the fact that no one knew what happened to Gretchen. People discussed various theories. Some thought she might have run away from home, others believed she went swimming in the river and drowned. However, 
The most terrifying version was that someone had abducted her. Parents stopped letting their children go out unattended. One woman even cut her daughter's long hair to make her look like a boy. Once, a safe and peaceful town turned into a place where people lived in uncertainty and fear. Simultaneously with the search, the police interviewed everyone who could be connected to Gretchen. During these conversations, investigators received several potential leads. One witness reported seeing a girl resembling Gretchen near the church that morning. A green station wagon approached her, but the witness did not see what happened next. Another person shared a similar story, but in this case, a white Cadillac approached the girl. The police followed up on these leads investigating the owners of vehicles matching the descriptions, but could not establish their involvement. Four days after Gretchen's disappearance, a new lead emerged in the case. A resident of the town of Westchester contacted the police. He had found children's shorts that matched the description immediately showed them to the girl's mother, who said they did not belong to her daughter. From that point on, the case stalled for several weeks. The police scaled back the extensive searches and focused on the investigation. They continued to interview people, check incoming leads, but with each passing day, there was less hope of finding Gretchen alive. This continued for two months until a call came to the police on October 14th. A man went for a run in a large national park, approximately 20 minutes drive from Brumall. He noticed something strange in the thickets and initially didn't understand what he was dealing with. Only upon closer inspection did he realize that he was looking at human remains. The man immediately ran to the park rangers and informed them of the discovery and they called the police. Officers quickly realized that they were dealing with the remains of a girl, but due to the advanced state of decomposition, establishing her identity was extremely difficult. Initially, they thought it might be Gretchen's body. The mother confirmed that they belonged to her daughter as she had sewn those clothes for her. Later, forensic experts confirmed that it was indeed Gretchen by matching the remains with the girl's dental records. They also determined that the cause of death was several severe blows to the head, leading to the case being reclassified as a homicide. Due to the extent of decomposition, they couldn't establish any other details, including whether the victim had been subjected to violence. Additionally, in 1975, DNA analysis was not yet in use, so investigators were once again left without any leads. Nevertheless, news of the murder stirred up the local community again, and more tips started pouring into the police. People realized that a dangerous criminal might still be among them, and everyone was interested in catching them as soon as possible. Investigators received dozens of reports about suspicious men seen in the vicinity of the park, but all these leads led to dead ends. They also checked everyone living within a few kilometers who had a history of violent crimes, but this yielded no results. A few months after the discovery of the body, the case came to a standstill and there were no further developments. Over the following years, the investigation was periodically reopened, reviewing the few leads available, but each time it ended in failure. The main problem was that detectives had no clues. Even when the police began actively using DNA analysis, it played no role in this case since no foreign samples were found on the girl's remains or her clothing. Eventually, this case remained unsolved for many decades. It was occasionally mentioned in newspapers, featured in reports, but only in recent times did Gretchen's murder regain widespread public attention. Two journalists, Joanne and Mike, decided to write a book about the crime. They worked on it for several years, piecing together all available information and attempting to discover new facts. 
Both journalists grew up in Brumal and were roughly the same age as Gretchen. Joanne, who was only nine at the time of her death, vividly remembered those events as they changed not only her life, but the entire town. After Gretchen's disappearance, children could no longer roam the streets or leave home without parental supervision. All of them feared that the criminal might strike again, and this fear haunted them for all these years. Even young children could sense how their lives had changed, so they all remembered Gretchen's murder throughout the years. For the book, Joanne and Mike gained access to case materials and personally spoke with dozens of people related to it. They meticulously reconstructed the events of those days, resulting in a detailed narrative of the story. The book was published in 2022, helping bring widespread attention to the case. However, its main impact, unexpectedly for everyone, occurred a few months later. A woman called the police and said she wanted to talk about Gretchen's case. She met with the detective who had worked on the investigation. The woman recounted that at the time of the murder, she was 10 years old and lived in a town called Havertown just a few hundred meters from Gretchen's home. She was friends with the girl and her older sisters, as well as many other children in the area, often staying overnight at her friends' houses. On one of those days, something terrible happened. She stayed overnight at the house of two sisters. In the middle of the night, the girl woke up to someone touching her. Opening her eyes, she saw their father in front of her, who immediately rushed out of the room. Despite this, the girl was afraid to talk about it. The same story repeated the next night. The father of her friends came again and started touching her. In the morning, the girl finally told his daughter about it, and to her surprise, the daughter said that he did it quite often. She added that the father came at night not only to her, but also to her sister. Upon returning home, the girl told her parents everything, but instead of reporting it to the police, they simply prohibited her from going to her friend's house. All of this happened exactly a week before Gretchen's disappearance. After this revelation, the woman provided the detective with the name of the father of these girls. It was David Zanstra, the same priest who taught at Sunday school. Her story didn't end there. She also revealed that a month after Gretchen's disappearance, a man attempted to abduct one of her friends twice. The girl refused to get into his car and later told her that he was a pastor. As proof of her words, the witness presented her personal diary to the detective, which she kept during those years. On September 15, 1975, she wrote that her friend asked her to keep it a secret because she feared that David Zanstra might harm her. Upon learning all this information, the police immediately reopened the investigation. Examining the case materials, detectives found several peculiarities that indirectly could point to David's involvement. Firstly, as we recall, he was the one who reported Gretchen's disappearance to the police. The priest provided investigators with a detailed description of the girl's clothing. According to him, she wore dark blue zippered shorts with front clasps, non-zippered pockets, and buttons. He added that she had a white top and her hair was braided. With all this detail, he claimed not to have seen Gretchen that day, raising the reasonable question of how he knew what clothes she was wearing. Especially after the discovery of her body, David's statements were fully confirmed. She was wearing those exact clothes. Secondly, based on the case materials, classes at the Sunday school started about 50 minutes later that morning because David Zanstra was absent from the church. Thus, the man would have had enough time to abduct the girl, kill her, dispose of the body in the park, and then return to the church to start lessons. According to David's statements after Gretchen's disappearance, he conducted classes at the Sunday school, then put some children in his van and gave them a lift to her father's church. 
He insisted that he did not see the girl that morning and only noticed her absence when her father brought it to his attention. Another interesting fact was that David, along with his wife and three children, moved to another state just a few months after the girl's disappearance. In addition to this, the priest owned several cars, one of which was a green station wagon. As we recall, a witness told the police that she saw a similar car approaching the girl near the church on the day of Gretchen's disappearance. Putting all this information together, detectives decided to talk to the man. At that time, he was 83 years old and lived in Georgia. On July 17, 2023, they met with him at the police station and began questioning him. Realizing that investigators suspected him of murder, David Zanstra began to deny everything, but then they laid all their cards on the table. They told him they had statements from a woman he had touched during a sleepover at his home. The woman also shared the story of how the man had assaulted both of her daughters. Upon hearing this, David was stunned, and soon his behavior changed dramatically. Understanding that his dirty secrets had been exposed, he stopped denying what he had done, and 48 years after the incident, he began to talk. According to his account, that morning, he drove to the church of Gretchen's father in his green American Motor station wagon and saw the girl leaving her house. Waiting until there were no witnesses around, he approached her and offered her a ride. Gretchen, without any hesitation, got into his car. Firstly, she knew David well because their fathers were friends. Secondly, she was heading to his Sunday school classes. Instead of the church, he took the girl to a deserted park, stopped the car, and told her to undress. Gretchen refused and said she wanted to go home. In response, David Zanstra struck her several times on the head, causing her to lose consciousness. The priest removed her clothes, satisfied himself, and then took her to another park. Unable to feel the girl's pulse, he carried her body into the bushes and covered it with branches. Having finished, David drove back to the church to conduct classes. After hearing this account, the police arrested David Zanstra in connection with the murder of the girl, after which they extradited him to Pennsylvania. He was placed in jail awaiting trial, but for the police, this was just the beginning of a more extensive investigation. Considering that Zanstra had assaulted at least several girls, detectives understood that probably others had suffered from his actions. Now that the truth was known, detectives took his DNA sample and began searching for matches in other unsolved cases. They also investigated unsolved disappearances of girls in the cities where David had been a priest. Unfortunately, the results were not long in coming. Investigators quickly came across the disappearance of four-year-old Amanda Campbell from California in 1991. Like Gretchen, she walked out of her house in a small, quiet neighborhood and disappeared without a trace. David Zanstra worked as a priest in that area at the time. Currently, there is no evidence against him, but the police say that this case has several extremely similar moments to Gretchen's abduction, and the priest may be the same perpetrator. In addition to this, they continue to explore his possible involvement in other crimes. Since all this is happening right now, in the coming months, we may learn a lot of new details. As for the trial in the murder case of Gretchen, it has not started yet. And perhaps David's lawyers will want to prolong this process and advise him to retract his confession. In this case, the trial could stretch for years, and there are no guarantees that the man will live to see the verdict. This is a story that took place in the summer of 2021 and shocked and outraged the entire United Kingdom. A 33-year-old woman disappeared on her way home, practically in the center of London. She was searched for several days, and when the horrifying truth became known, everyone was shocked. In this video, 
we will talk about what happened to Sarah Everard and how it affected all of British society. Sarah Everard was born in 1987 in the British county of Surrey. In her childhood, she moved with her parents to the city of York, where she completed high school and college. After some time, she moved to London and got a job at a marketing agency, where she soon became the head of the department. On the evening of March 3rd, 2021, Sarah spent time at a friend's place. Around 9 p.m., she headed home, deciding to walk. The route was supposed to take about 50 minutes. On the way, she called her boyfriend, and they agreed to meet the next day. Since then, she had not been in touch, and on the next day, March 4th, her boyfriend reported her disappearance to the police. Law enforcement agencies began the search and first reconstructed Sarah's route from her friend's place to her home. This route passed through the Clapham area, which is near the center of London. At the same time, hundreds of volunteers joined the search, putting up flyers, searching streets and parks. The police interviewed about 750 potential witnesses and examined surveillance camera footage. One of the cameras captured Sarah walking down the street at 9.28 p.m., talking to her boyfriend on the phone. Four minutes later, she was seen on a passing police car camera. Unfortunately, these images did not help the police determine the woman's subsequent locations. The search lasted for several days, and on March 9th, six days after Sarah's disappearance, the police announced a suspect in her abduction. Surprisingly, the suspect turned out to be 48-year-old police officer Wayne Cousins. He joined the Metropolitan Police in September 2018 and patrolled the streets near Westminster Palace, the residence of the Prime Minister and foreign embassies. Moreover, he had automatic weapons, which not all police officers in Britain have access to. The police did not specify the evidence that led them to their colleague. It was only known that a search was conducted in the suspect's house, and his partner was detained, initially suspected of aiding the criminal, but later released without charges. Immediately after the arrest, a wave of outrage swept across Britain. However, the situation escalated even further. On March 10th, the police discovered human remains in the woods near the town of Ashford, approximately 90 kilometers from London. They were found in a black bag, and it took several days for experts to identify the person using dental records. The deceased turned out to be Sarah. The police did not specify what the perpetrator had done to the body, requiring the use of dental records for identification. Immediately after this discovery, Cousins was charged with murder. While in custody, he was taken to the hospital twice, both times with a head injury. According to the official statement, the suspect sustained these injuries while alone in his cell. Let's not speculate on how he actually got them. The entire UK was shocked that a police officer had abducted a woman almost in the center of London without much difficulty. On March 13th, people decided to hold a vigil to honor Sarah's memory and express their outrage. However, the London police banned the event, citing anti-COVID restrictions. The or As a result, the population split into two parts. Some people stayed at home and lit candles near their doors at 9.30 p.m. This action was joined by Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Others took the ban to heart and took to the streets. Several hundred people, mostly women, gathered near an improvised memorial with signs, candles, and flashlights. Initially, everything proceeded calmly. The arriving police officers did not intervene and stood aside. However, at some point, law enforcement decided to disperse the vigil, citing the same anti-COVID restrictions. As a result, several women were detained, such police behavior caused even more outrage across the country. 
In response to the criticism, the head of the police stated that there were anti-COVID restrictions in place, and the gathering put themselves and others at risk. However, these explanations satisfied neither the public nor the government. Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Mayor of London Sadiq Khan criticized the commissioner's actions and expressed support for the women who participated in the vigil. They also promised to take measures to protect women from harassment on the streets of London. Over the next few days, more people gathered at the memorial, but this time the police did not intervene and only stood aside. Participants in the vigil demanded not only a fair investigation into Sarah's case, but also safety for all women on the streets. Meanwhile, Wayne Cousins was preparing to face trial while in custody. The public awaited the start of the trial to finally learn the details of what happened. The trial began only several months later, and on July 8th, the criminal pleaded guilty. Several days before the incident, Wayne rented a car and bought a roll of strong film. The perpetrator was not acquainted with Sarah Everard and chose her as a victim after seeing her on the street. It is not entirely clear how he managed to get her into the car. Investigators suggested that the man might have used his police uniform or badge to convince the woman to voluntarily get into the car. Otherwise, if he had tried to do it forcefully, Sarah would have screamed and someone would have heard. Afterward, Wayne headed to the area near the village of Telman Stowe, which is about a 2.5-hour drive from London. Arriving at around 1 a.m., he subjected Sarah to violence, killed her, and hid the body. Only months later did authorities reveal the cause of death, strangulation. His route was traced using street and road cameras. Investigators also obtained information from the company where the man rented the car to ensure that he was the one driving. On the morning of March 4th, the day after the murder, the criminal returned the rented car. In the following days, he told colleagues and acquaintances that he was under significant stress and no longer wanted to carry weapons. On March 8th, when he was supposed to start his shift, Wayne claimed to be sick and did not go to work. On the next day, around 8 p.m., his colleagues came to his home with an arrest warrant. It was later revealed that the man had erased all data from his smartphone 40 minutes before their arrival. During the first interrogation, Wayne gave colleagues a fabricated story worked out to the smallest detail. He claimed that he often used the services of call girls but was facing financial difficulties and could not pay them. Then a criminal group from Eastern Europe, which allegedly controlled this business, began threatening him. As a solution to the problem, they supposedly demanded that the police officer bring them a new woman. Of course, no one believed this story. Firstly, the man served in a fairly elite police unit, and threatening him over a small amount of money would hardly be reasonable. Secondly, the whole story simply does not make sense. Even if this story were true, does it make Wayne less guilty? Certainly not. During the investigation, another interesting fact emerged. In 2015, the Kent County Police Department received a complaint about a man sitting naked in a car. Apparently, the police had enough information to identify this man as Wayne Cousins. However, this never happened. At that time, he was already serving in the police, but in a different department. As you can understand, he would likely have been fired for such behavior. But that's not all. In February 2021, Wayne publicly exposed himself in a restaurant, after which two police officers were called to the scene. Despite this, he also faced no consequences, although the investigation into this incident continued until the summer. Just a few days before the attack on Sarah, the man was questioned in connection with this situation. It is expected that the final court session will take place on September 29th. If there are no new twists in the case, the man may receive a final verdict. 
In conclusion, what do we have? Firstly, it seems that Wayne's colleagues turned a blind eye to repeated incidents of public exposure. For any of them, he could not only lose his job, but also face criminal punishment. Secondly, this situation showed all the residents of London that a woman can be abducted almost in the very center of the city, on well-lit streets. We still do not know exactly how the police established Wayne's involvement in this crime. This monstrous story left no one indifferent. A 14-year-old Alice went out for a walk and disappeared without a trace. She was searched for over a month, and this investigation became the largest in the last nine years. Thanks to hundreds of police officers and surveillance camera footage, this mystery was eventually solved, but the truth turned out to be much more convoluted and shocking. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Alice Gross. Alice Gross was born on Valentine's Day, February 14, 2000, in London. She grew up in a loving family with an older sister. From an early age, Alice showed a passion for creativity. She loved drawing, playing the piano, and violin. Later, Alice started writing her own amazing songs and performing them to her own music. We will show one such composition by Alice at the end of this video. In addition, Alice was interested in fashion design, and at the age of 11, she even created dresses for herself, which she planned to wear to her school prom. When she was 13, doctors diagnosed her with anorexia and depression. Despite all this, Alice continued to pursue her creative interests, and in the future, she had every chance of achieving colossal success. On August 28, 2014, Alice told her mother that she would go for a walk. She had school holidays and plenty of free time, so Alice liked to walk along a small canal and river near her home. They lived in a London suburb called Canoe, and her usual route was 4.5 kilometers. Alice left around 3 p.m., promising her parents to return around 6 p.m. Later, she wrote that she would be home soon. However, Alice did not return at the appointed time, and when it was already 7 p.m., her parents began to worry. They tried to call her, but Alice's phone was turned off. The fact that Alice suffered from anorexia and depression only added to the concern. Her parents feared that something might have happened to her. Due to her physical condition, she experienced constant weakness and could faint. The parents called several of Alice's friends in the hope that she might be with them. But no one had seen Alice that day. So the mother and father decided to contact the police. They immediately began the search and first examined the route Alice usually took. Her relatives and family friends also participated in the search. Unfortunately, they did not find any traces of Alice, but detectives were able to locate several witnesses. Thanks to their testimonies about the places Alice had passed, the police were able to more accurately determine her route, narrowing down the search area and selecting several street cameras that could have captured her. Looking the recordings, detectives finally find Alice. Almost immediately after leaving home, she appeared on the first camera, heading along the Grand Union Canal. After some time, she was noticed in the area lower down the canal, the last time the camera captured her on the way back, near Trumper's Way Bridge. The police also informed the media about the disappearance, and in the first hours after her disappearance, the news spread throughout London. Thanks to this, detectives received several calls from witnesses who had seen Alice. Based on the camera footage and witness statements, she disappeared on her way home, deviating from most of her usual route. But what happened to her remained a mystery. Three days passed, the police continued to study camera recordings in nearby areas and searched local parks and other secluded places. At the same time, patrols visited houses along Alice's route, questioning local residents. On September 1st, Alice's relatives recorded a video appeal, pleading for her to come home. At that time, investigators considered several theories. The first and most alarming 
was the version of abduction. Despite the fact that most of Alice's route passed along city streets, there were many remote and hidden areas where someone could attack her. In addition, the London police often dealt with situations where people were abducted right in the center, not to mention the suburbs. The second was the theory of running away from home. Alice's parents feared that depression might push her to such a decision. They also did not rule out that due to her illnesses, Alice could take her own life. But for the police, these versions seemed unlikely. At the age of 14, Alice would hardly be able to run away and hide, especially without outside help. And if she had taken her own life, she would most likely have been found by now. With each passing day, this case attracted more attention from the public. On September 3rd, it was transferred to the special unit of Scotland Yard. Despite usually dealing only with murders, detectives assessed the chances of Alice returning home as high. Scotland Yard organized extensive searches, joined by hundreds of volunteers. Seeing the heartbreaking appeals of her parents and sister in the news, sympathetic Londoners walked through the area from early morning until late at night. And the next day, detectives announced the discovery of a significant clue. They found Alice's backpack, in which her shoes, worn on her on that day, were placed. It was relatively close to her home. This discovery allowed the police to narrow down the search area and focus on a small section near the canal. Investigators understood that she was unlikely to have taken off her shoes, thrown them along with the backpack, and run away. She had no spare shoes with her, making the situation even more perplexing. Scotland Yard decided to publish all available camera recordings on which Alice was captured. The backpack with the shoes indicated that Alice could be in serious danger. The main version still remained abduction, but investigators did not completely rule out the possibility that she could have committed suicide. For this reason, they tried to use all available resources to locate her. Publishing the recordings could attract more attention from the public, and someone might remember seeing Alice that day. In addition to this, several hundred more personnel from various agencies joined the search, and a total of 600 people were working on the case. Thus, this investigation became the largest in terms of the number of involved police officers since 2005. Some of them conducted a direct survey of the area, while others studied recordings from hundreds of cameras that Alice might have appeared on. Scotland Yard also offered a reward of $20,000 for any information that would help find Alice. Although the police could not locate her phone, they requested data from the mobile company about its last known location. It turned out that Alice had sent a message to her father almost from the same place where her backpack would later be found. Everything indicated that investigators needed to focus specifically on this area. It was decided to thoroughly search the territory within a few square kilometers. Every inch of land and water was examined manually. Police squads literally felt the bottom of the river and canal for any clues. Two days after the discovery of the backpack, it became known that the police had arrested a 25-year-old man on suspicion of Alice's murder. The next day, they arrested another person but refused to comment on the situation until all details were clarified. However, both suspects were soon released and Scotland Yard stated that they could not establish the involvement of these two individuals in Alice's disappearance. More than a week passed, and there were no progress in the case. Only on September 16th, the police made another statement. They announced that they were looking for a 41-year-old man named Arnis Zalkalns in connection with Alice's disappearance. He had come to England from Latvia seven years ago, lived in the area, and worked as a builder. Scotland Yard became interested in him for two seemingly unrelated reasons. Firstly, Arnis's colleagues reported his disappearance to the police on September 3rd. He did not show up for work, did not answer calls, and was not at home. It seemed like he had simply 
disappeared. Secondly, detectives found out that Zalcalan's route from home to work passed approximately along the same path that the girl walked on the day of her disappearance. All of this was not enough to make any conclusions about the man's involvement in the Alice's disappearance, but soon, detectives discovered something really alarming. On one of the camera recordings, they noticed a middle-aged man riding a bicycle on a bridge where Alice had passed just a few minutes ago. This man turned out to be Zal Collins. After some time, he appeared on the next camera. Here, detectives noticed a very strange moment. The distance between these cameras should have taken only a few minutes, but the man on the bicycle spent almost an hour traveling this road. A reasonable question arose. What was he doing all this time on such a short stretch? The police examined this area and concluded that he could not have taken a longer route to the next camera because he simply was not there. What added to the concern was the fact that all this happened in the very area where Alice's trail supposedly ended. The police also concluded that the man's clothes were wet when he went out on the road. Continuing to study the cameras, detectives noticed Zal Collins on his bicycle returning to the same place after two hours and leaving again after 50 minutes. Moreover, he did not appear on the camera located on the bridge. This indicated that the man had spent all this time inside a small blind zone. After about an hour, he appeared on the camera at a local store, buying beer. The next morning, the situation repeated. Zal Collins returned to the same place between the cameras around 7 a.m. and also went back there in the evening. All this was enough to obtain a search warrant for his home. It turned out that the man lived there with his girlfriend and their two daughters. His girlfriend also had no idea where Zal Collins had disappeared to. Upon learning that he was suspected of killing the girl, she stated that Arnis could never do something like that. She described him as a caring and loving father. However, Scotland Yard delved into the man's biography. It turned out that Zal Collins had a dark criminal past. In 1998, while he was in Latvia, he cold-bloodedly and calculatedly murdered his wife having previously dug a grave for her in the forest, for which he received only seven years in prison. After serving his sentence, he moved to England, and local law enforcement had no knowledge of his criminal history in his home country. Police searched Zal Collins' house and found a recently dug piece of land on his property. They did not disclose information about whether they found any evidence there, but a significant discovery awaited them in the basement. There, they found the broken rear panel of a white iPhone 4S. The same phone belonged to Alice. Examining the contents of his computer, the police also found that the man had searched for information on Alice Gross's disappearance a few days after the incident. Based on all this, Arnis Zalkons was declared a fugitive. Scotland Yard feared that he might have escaped back to Latvia or another European country, so they searched for him throughout the European Union. However, law enforcement agencies failed to find a single trace of the suspect. Meanwhile, a month had passed since Alice's disappearance, and on September 30th, the police made a disheartening statement a human body was discovered in the river near the girl's disappearance. At that time, the identity was not yet established, but the police shared a horrifying fact. Someone had put in considerable effort to ensure that the body remained submerged and did not resurface. Only the next day did law enforcement confirm that the deceased was Alice Gross, though no one doubted it by then. Everything happened right where she disappeared, the cause of death was strangulation. It turned out that Alice's body was wrapped in construction bags tied to a large stump. In addition, the criminal had constructed a whole contraption with a bicycle wheel and bricks, which also prevented the body from surfacing. 
She was wearing only one sock. Detectives visited the construction site where Zalkalms worked and found out that the same bags were used to conceal Alice's body. After the discovery of the body, the police continued to search for Zal Collins, working closely with Interpol and local European intelligence agencies, but they still could not find any traces of him. This continued until October 4th, when investigators made a shocking discovery. They found the hanging body of a man in the park, just a kilometer from the scene of Alice's murder. Two days later, experts confirmed that the deceased was Arnis Zalcolms. Nobody expected such a turn of events. Scotland Yard's main theory was that the suspect had escaped to Europe, but in reality, he had been under their noses the whole time. Medical experts concluded that the man had taken his own life on the day of his disappearance, September 3rd, and his body went unnoticed for an entire month. This was not surprising, given that Zalcalms chose a very remote and inaccessible location where he was extremely difficult to notice. With Zalcalms DNA in hand, investigators gathered even more evidence. Near the location where Alice's body was found, the police found a cigarette butt that was sent to the laboratory. Experts extracted DNA from the filter, which matched Zalcalms' sample. Moreover, in the laboratory, they claimed that with a high degree of probability, the perpetrator's DNA was found on the victim's body. They could not assert this with 100% certainty due to how long the body had been underwater. His DNA was also found on the Alice's backpack and shoes. By that time, the police had uncovered another horrifying fact. Two years after moving to England, Zalcalms had harassed a 14-year-old girl just a kilometer from where Alice's body was found. A man attempted to commit an indecent act, but the victim survived. The man was arrested. Here is where it gets interesting. The girl did not file an official accusation and the criminal was simply released. It is not entirely clear how this could happen, but the fact remains. An adult man assaulted the girl, came into police custody, and escaped punishment. Furthermore, information about this case surfaced only after the criminal's body was found in the park. Despite all this, the police continued their investigation, and it took some time to piece together the events. According to their version on that fateful day, August 28th, Zal Collins was riding his bicycle on the same route where Alice used to walk. Noticing her in a secluded area hidden from prying eyes, he attacked her with the intention of committing lewd acts. The subsequent developments will never be known, but the outcome was tragic. Zal Collins killed Alice, hiding her body in several attempts, constantly returning to the scene. It remains unknown why he chose to end his own life after the act. Can this be considered a display of conscience? A highly debatable question. Alice's parents, who endured such a terrible tragedy, were outraged by the government's actions. They questioned how the authorities of the United Kingdom allowed a convicted murderer to enter the country and live there. They dedicated many years to advocating for the government to tighten control over migrants. Unfortunately, they did not succeed in achieving significant changes. A month after the discovery of Zalcalan's body, another interesting event occurred. The medical expert involved in the investigation left a folder with case documents on a train. 30 pages contained important information about the murder, including medical details and undisclosed specifics. The public, media, and Alice's parents harshly criticized the police, but they were helpless as the folder could not be found. However, no one decided to judge the deceased criminal. Investigators stated that if he were alive, they would have had enough evidence to bring the case to court. But there was no guarantee of a guilty verdict. Instead, a hearing was held in, 
which the jury acknowledged the obvious fact. Alice was murdered, and her death was not an accident. This procedure was formal and played no significant role. The funeral took place on October 23rd, with thousands of people gathering at the memorial. At the end of the ceremony, a beautiful song, written and performed by Alice, was shown on a large screen. The girl disappeared right from her home under very strange circumstances. What happened next seemed more like an incredibly twisted movie plot than a real-life case. Believing in what was happening was very difficult because such a combination of events is extremely rare. When the unexpected truth was finally revealed 15 years later, it only made things worse for everyone. Jessica Dishon was born on May 2, 1982, in the small American town of Shepherdsville, Kentucky. It was a quiet and peaceful place where most residents were involved in farming and knew each other. Jessica had two younger brothers, and from an early age, she had to take care of them while her parents were at work. Thanks to this, she became very independent, and her parents could always rely on her. At the age of 15, she took a part-time job at a local restaurant to save up for her first car. She wanted a red Pontiac, and after a few years, she managed to save enough money to buy it. Despite her part-time job, Jessica excelled in her studies and planned to attend college to become an accountant after high school. When she was 17, Jessica entered her senior year, 
She also started dating a guy and was very happy with the relationship. The morning of Friday, September 10th, started as usual. Jessica's parents left for work while she was still asleep. After that, her younger brothers went to the bus stop and boarded the school bus. Jessica stayed home alone and was supposed to drive to school in her car. Around noon, her mother returned home and immediately noticed something strange. Jessica's car was parked in front of the house, although she should have been in class at that time. The woman entered the house and headed to her daughter's room. Her first thought was that Jessica might not have heard the alarm and overslept for school, but she was not in the bedroom. After that, she thought that, for some reason, her daughter might have asked her father for a ride to school. She called her husband, but he said he had left for work alone that morning. The mother considered that there might be some problems with Jessica's car and took the spare key from home to try to start it. However, as soon as she approached the car, she witnessed a very disturbing sight. The driver's door was slightly ajar, and on the seat lay Jessica's cell phone. Two digits, nine and one, were entered on the screen. Under the seat lay one of Jessica's sneakers and the car keys, and behind her textbooks, work clothes, and a purse. The woman immediately feared the worst. It was almost obvious that someone had tried to dial emergency services 911 on Jessica's phone but didn't manage to do it in time. Additionally, Jessica could not have just left all her belongings in the car and walked away on foot. She lived on the outskirts of the town and she would have had to walk several kilometers along the road. The parents called the school, where they were told that their daughter did not attend any classes. According to the rules, educational institutions should have contacted the relatives and reported it much earlier, but for some reason, they did not. A few hours later, Jessica's best friend, with whom they worked at the restaurant, called the parents. She said that Jessica did not show up for her shift, adding more concern. After this, the parents decided to contact the police and went to the sheriff's office. They explained that their daughter had missed both school and work, and all her belongings were left in the unlocked car, including the phone with the digits 9 and 1 entered. However, they faced another problem here. The sheriff stated that the girl had probably just gone somewhere and would eventually return home, so he advised them to wait until the next day. He was not bothered by the fact that there was only one sneaker left in the car, without which the girl could hardly have gone anywhere. The parents were infuriated by this response, and they tried to convince the sheriff that their daughter might be in danger. However, the police officer refused to react, and they had to return home. In the end, the parents had to take matters into their own hands. They called all relatives, friends, and acquaintances, but none of them had seen Jessica. Along with them, they searched the town but they could not find the girl. The next morning, the parents went to the sheriff again and said that their daughter still had not returned. This time, he decided to send two officers to their home to inspect Jessica's car, but here arose another problem. The police officers behaved extremely unprofessionally. They examined the car without gloves, touching the interior and all the items inside. After that, they simply left taking no evidence with them and not even checking the girl's room as required by the protocol. Once again, the parents had to take matters into their own hands. They turned to the local media, spoke about their daughter's disappearance and emphasized that the police showed no interest in the case. Together with relatives and friends, they began their own search and printed numerous flyers with information about the missing girl. Jessica's father and his brother led the search. They knew the area well and tried to understand where the girl might likely be. At that time, they feared that Jessica was already dead, so the brother suggested searching the area near the local river. Among the locals, this place had a bad reputation, being overgrown and difficult to access, often witnessing various criminal events, from the sale and use of illegal substances to murders. The girl's relatives combed this area for several hours, but found nothing. The next day, something very strange happened. Jessica's parents were at home and their son was playing in the yard. At some point, 
He ran into the house and said he heard a cry for help, and it seemed like Jessica's voice to him. The girl's father grabbed his shotgun and rushed outside, trying to figure out where the cry came from. At the same time, his brother arrived at the house and immediately joined him. Soon, they noticed smoke rising from their neighbor's property, 40-year-old David Brooks. Approaching, they saw the man burning something resembling clothing on his land. All of this looked very suspicious, and Jessica's father asked Brooks for permission to inspect his farm. However, he refused and demanded that they leave. The relatives of the missing girl also noticed another oddity. Before all these events, they had normal relations with Brooks and his family, but almost immediately after Jennifer's disappearance, he started behaving quite strangely. The man began regularly driving slowly past their house, observing them and smiling. Then, Jessica's parents started receiving strange phone calls during which an unknown man remained silent and breathed into the receiver. They believed it was Brooks, but couldn't understand the reason for such behavior. After he burned some clothes on his property, Jessica's parents decided to contact the police again, which still showed no interest in the search. They explained the situation, and officers went to Brooks with search dogs. The dogs were given Jessica's scent, and they pointed to the ashes from the burning. However, no useful evidence was found there. The dogs also found black gloves in one of the sheds on which they detected the smell of a corpse. Throughout this time, Brooks behaved very strangely, and when the officers approached the ashes, his suspicious behavior intensified. Despite this, the police did not see any direct connection between Brooks and the disappearance, so they left with nothing. Jessica's parents were once again disappointed with the police's actions prompting her father to call the FBI. Although the Bureau usually does not initiate investigations based on calls from relatives of missing persons, this time they decided to get involved immediately. After hearing all the alarming facts discovered by the girl's parents, they concluded that something terrible might have happened to her. From that moment, a real investigation began, which the police had refused to conduct. FBI agents took fingerprints from Jessica's room and her car and collected all potential evidence for examination in the laboratory. Simultaneously, investigators organized extensive searches in the area involving helicopters and volunteers. They also thoroughly examined the bottom of the pond near the girl's home in case her body might be there. FBI agents also carefully searched Brooks' business, and in one of the sheds, they made a very disturbing discovery. There were printed photos of Jessica. After this, the detectives had almost no doubts that Brooks was involved in the case. They also suspected that his 35-year-old brother Joseph was involved, as he also behaved very strangely. However, there was one problem. During the search, Investigators found no evidence that would allow them to arrest the brothers, so they focused all their efforts on the search, almost certain that the girl was already dead. On September 27th, 17 days after Jennifer's disappearance, a call came to the police. A woman was driving along the road near the river where the girl's father, with his acquaintances, had searched for her in the first days. Passing by a tree a few dozen meters from the road, she saw something strange and stopped. Approaching a bit closer, the woman realized that something resembling a human body was next to the tree and immediately contacted the police. FBI agents arrived at the scene and indeed saw a dead girl there, missing some fingers and limbs. There was a rope on her feet with traces of red and silver paint. Part of her clothing was missing. Due to the degree of decomposition, they could not visually confirm that it was Jessica, so they directed officers to her home and asked her parents to help with identification. Jessica's father could not bring himself to look at his dead daughter, but her mother agreed. When she arrived at the scene, she couldn't tell for sure if it was Jessica just by looking at her face. However, she immediately saw a small butterfly tattoo on the body, exactly like her daughter's. Medical experts confirmed the identity of the deceased and determined that she died from strangulation. 
numerous bruises were also found on her body, and experts found that the limbs and fingers were severed from her body after her death. Another fact was a real blow to Jessica's parents. It turned out that she was alive for about three days after her disappearance. It seemed that the police had a real chance to save her, but they took absolutely no steps in that direction. After the discovery of the body, FBI agents decided to interrogate Brooks again, and here they encountered something interesting. In their initial conversation, the man claimed to have seen Jessica near her home on the morning she disappeared. However, he now changed his story and stated that he did not see her that day. Instead, he allegedly was at home in bed with his wife. But when detectives asked her about it, she denied her husband's words. After that, FBI agents asked him what he would do if they found his fingerprints on the victim's body. Although no such evidence was found, Brooks's response seemed highly suspicious. He said that in that case, he would have to confess to everything. Later, he failed a polygraph test, and the FBI decided to bring the case to court. They understood that the chances of a guilty verdict were quite low, as they failed to find any direct evidence linking Brooks to the murder. All they had were a set of alarming but indirect signs of his involvement. Therefore, they continued working on this case and searching for any additional evidence while preparing for the trial. Investigators recalled another interesting detail. During the search of Brooks' car, they found a spool of rope that closely resembled the one used to tie the victim's legs. However, no DNA samples were found on it, so this evidence also fell into the category of circumstantial. The trial began only in January 2003, and Brooks' lawyer seized on the complete lack of evidence. Here, something else came to light. It turned out that when the body was discovered, investigators also found some missing limbs of the victim, placed them in special containers, and inexplicably handed them over to the local police. They ignored the large labels instructing them to store the limbs in the refrigerator and left the boxes at room temperature, causing them to almost completely decompose. Even if there could have been some evidence, including possible DNA traces of the killer, it all disappeared due to this mistake. All other circumstantial pieces of evidence against Brooks also lacked sufficient weight, and ultimately, the jurors could not reach a unanimous decision. As a result, the man was released. According to state laws, he could only be recharged with this crime if new evidence were found. For Jessica's parents, this was a heavy blow. They hardly doubted that Brooks was behind her murder. Moreover, if the police had taken their work seriously, their daughter might have been saved. This continued until 2019, when a new detective, Lynn Hunts, joined the local department. She was assigned to take on old unsolved cases, and her first focus was Jessica Deshawn's murder. Reviewing the case materials, she was shocked by the unprofessionalism of her predecessors. Almost all documents were filled with errors. There were no mentions of conversations with case participants, and the evidence was not properly documented. In other words, everything was so useless that she had to start the investigation almost from scratch, 13 years after the murder. First, she decided to talk to the girl's relatives. One of her brothers, who by then was an adult, living separately from their parents, handed her a box with Jessica's belongings from her car, which he had kept since the police returned those items. Hunts was once again surprised that her colleagues had so carelessly handled the evidence, not placing it in storage as required. Now, after so many years, these items were unlikely to shed light on what happened. Nevertheless, she continued to carefully study everything she could find. Soon, among the documents, she found an interesting detail. Brooks' EQ test results. It stated that his IQ was only 61, considered an extremely low value. This cast doubt on all police actions, including Brooks' interrogations. With such a low level of intelligence, 
he might simply not have understood most of the questions asked, and his answers might not have been the most adequate. All this made her consider that the man might have had no connection to this case, as his strange behavior could easily be explained by his extremely low IQ. Then Hunts began to think about who else could have committed the murder. She extensively studied all the people involved in the case or simply living nearby. This continued until September 2014. Almost exactly 15 years after Jessica's death, a colleague working in another jurisdiction called the detective. He shared interesting information he had learned from an inmate who claimed to know the real identity of Jessica Deshawn's killer. Hunts treated this tip with skepticism, as most of the time, when prisoners wanted to share information with the police, it ended in disappointment and wasted time. Most of them made up stories to get early release or improve their living conditions. Nevertheless, she realized she couldn't ignore this information. She went to the prison and met with the man who supposedly had the relevant information. According to his story, he had shared a cell with someone convicted of child abuse, the same charge that had landed him in prison. On this basis, the two perverts became friends and shared details of their committed crimes. One day, the cellmate told him, among other things, that he had killed Jessica Dichon. After that, the informant gave the detective the name of this man, which shocked her. It was Stanley Dichon, Jessica's paternal uncle and her father's brother. According to the informant, Stanley told them that in childhood, he subjected the girl to violence for several years while living in their home, threatening to kill her or someone close to her if she spoke about what was happening. In the spring of 99, when Jessica got a boyfriend, Stanley began to fear that sooner or later she might confess to him about the abuse by her own uncle. On the morning of September 10th, Stanley came to her house when the girl was alone. She was about to get into her car and had already put all her things in it when he approached her and demanded an immediate breakup with that guy. Jessica refused to listen to him and threatened to expose his abuse if he did not leave her alone. He began to threaten her and the girl reached for the phone, trying to dial 911. After that, Stanley tried to grab her, but Jessica broke a free and ran into the house. The man followed her to her room, hit her, and wrapped the girl in her sheet. After that, he took her to an abandoned shed near the place where her body would later be found. Stanley kept her there for several days, abusing and subjecting her to violence. After that, he killed her, dragged the body to a visible place for discovery. He also told them that after the murder, he deprived the victim of some limbs to make the police think about the involvement of drug dealers. Detective Hunts immediately noted that this information had never been disclosed before. Only the closest relatives of the girl knew about the missing limbs, so the informant could not have invented this detail. As a final addition, he mentioned that Stanley had buried Jessica's sneakers under a broken tree not far from the shed. Hunts decided to verify all this information about the buried evidence. Considering the lack of sufficient personnel in the local police department, none of them could assist her in this matter. Therefore, she turned to Jessica's brother and a few other relatives who agreed to participate in the search. The woman did not tell them that Stanley might be the murderer because she needed to first find confirmation for such shocking accusations. On the first day of searching, they failed to find any evidence. Under heavy rain, they dug up places that matched the informant's description, but it yielded no results. On the next day, Jessica's brother and Hunts went there again. On the way, the man pointed out the abandoned shoe to the detective. They headed there and started digging, and almost immediately, they encountered the long-awaited breakthrough. They found the buried sheet, and Hunts hurried to Jessica's house. Throughout all these years, her parents had made no changes to her room. It remained exactly as it was on the day of their daughter's disappearance. Thanks to this, 
The detective easily confirmed that the found sheet was part of Jessica's bedding set. It was missing from the bed, and the other bedding items had the same pattern. After this, Stanley was arrested and brought in for questioning. The man refused to confess to the crime, but during the conversation with investigators, he was visibly shaken. Eventually, he was arrested and the case was handed over to the court. Jessica's father could not believe that his own brother had done such a thing to his daughter. He remained in a state of complete denial for a long time. However, over time, he came to terms with this unbearable fact. Later, the man recalled that in the first few days of her disappearance, it was Stanley who suggested they go search for the body near the river. However, during the search, he suddenly felt nauseous, and Stanley took his brother home. It turned out that this happened just a few hundred meters from the shed where the girl was. Apparently, Stanley diverted them from the path and prevented them from discovering her still alive. During the trial preparation, Detective Hunts continued delving into the suspect's past, trying to find additional evidence. She already knew that he had served time for abusing another girl in their family, but soon something else came to light. Several other women closely related to Stanley told the police that he had subjected them to violence at a young age. All of this happened following the same pattern. The man asked to stay with his relatives since he didn't have his own home at the time. When alone with the girls, the pervert committed his vile acts and forced them to stay silent through threats. Compiling all these stories together, the police concluded that Stanley had been engaged in this for three decades. Despite all this, Detective Hunts understood that obtaining a guilty verdict in the murder case would be quite challenging because there were practically no direct evidence against Stanley, such as fingerprints and DNA. She continued to dig into the case until she stumbled upon a box of papers she hadn't looked into before. Studying its contents, Hunts was once again shocked by the incompetence of her predecessors who worked on the case in its early years. In the box, there was a letter dated June 26, 2002. In it, another informant wrote to the police the same information that Hunts heard only 12 years later from a Kentucky prison inmate. By the summer of 2002, Stanley was already serving time for abusing an underage relative, and even then, he told his cellmate that he had killed Jessica. The cooperating inmate wrote a letter to the police department handling the case, detailing all the aspects of what Stanley had done to his niece. And what do you think the police did? They simply ignored this letter. Apparently, at that time, they were convinced of Brooks' involvement, so they did not even consider other suspects. Hunts was disappointed with the behavior of her colleagues because, without their mistakes, the case could have been solved as early as 2002. But now, after all these years, she had to wait for the trial and hope that the man would face punishment for what he had done. The trial began in 2015, and Stanley declared his innocence. Jessica's parents, who were present in the courtroom, could hardly lift their eyes to look at their relative who had shattered their lives. They were also furious at the fact that he couldn't alleviate their suffering by confessing to his actions. The prosecution understood that the chances of a guilty verdict in the murder case were quite low, and as for the cases of abuse against other relatives, there was also a problem. Each of them would have to testify in detail about what Stanley had done to them and also endure his lawyer trying to portray them as liars. After considering all this, a deal was proposed to the man. The prosecution agreed to drop the death penalty in exchange for Stanley admitting guilt to the abuse of relatives and the unintentional killing of Jessica. In the end, the man agreed and pleaded guilty. As per the terms of the deal, he was not required to disclose any details of his actions, which greatly angered the victim's parents. They wanted Stanley to tell the whole truth, but he continued.
to remain silent. The killer received a 20-year prison sentence with the possibility of parole after 15 years. Considering that he was 56 at the time of the sentence, Stanley could be released at the age of 71. Jessica's father then stated that if his brother didn't die in prison, he would wait for him to be released to take matters into his own hands. In 2019, Stanley gave his first interview, claiming that he didn't kill Jessica. According to him, he was at work that morning, but confirming this after 20 years was impossible. He also could not explain how two unrelated informants came up with identical stories with details that only the murderer should have known. As for David Brooks, detectives still do not rule out his possible minor involvement in the case. Stanley was acquainted with him and could have asked him to help get rid of the victim's belongings. Given Brooks's low intelligence, he might not have fully understood the severity of what was happening. It's possible that in the bonfire, he burned the girl's clothes and gloves on which the dogs detected the scent of the body. Perhaps Stanley deliberately left Jessica's photos in the shed to frame Brooks. However, it is unlikely we will ever know the truth. Brooks passed away in 2021 due to heart problems. Also, it's worth recalling the moment when on the third day of Jessica's disappearance, her younger brother heard a cry for help outside the house, thinking it was his sister. It still cannot be said with complete certainty what it was. At that time, the girl should have still been alive, but Stanley kept her in the shed, several kilometers away from her home. It's more likely that the child either imagined it amid such strong stress or someone else was shouting, but there are also quite unlikely versions. As we remember, immediately after Jessica's father ran outside, Stanley approached the house, indicating that he was nearby. One could assume that the girl was in his car with her mouth taped shut or unconscious. However, this theory seems unlikely. Share your opinion on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching.